Now, just a word on Confucianism itself. Confucius lived uh, at the same time that Plato lived. And both these men, Plato in Greece and Confucius in China, believed in political salvation. Uh, Plato, you might recall from high school, wrote the Republic, uh, putting together how you would put good government together. That was Plato's concern. And over there, far, far away in China, Confucius is also working at the themes of political salvation. And both men were extremely skeptical about the gods that people worshipped. Um, in fact, within uh, Greece, uh, with Socrates and so forth, the philosophers were urging a turning away from the gods and exactly what Confucius is, uh, is talking about over there in China. I just find it very amazing how the, the philosophical developments happening in uh, Europe, in Greece, uh, with these Greek philosophers, and the philosophical developments developing in China are taking place within the same century, in the, um, in the, uh, in the fourth century. It's, uh, it's very, very interesting. As this political philosophy is developing in China under Confucius's leadership, why there is enormous debate going on about what is the authority for ruling. How do you determine who is worthy to rule? And um, the consensus was that the ruler needs to be a righteous man. So it's, it's righteousness that should determine who the ruler is. Others would say, oh, no, it's actually heredity. Notice these emperors, 24 emperors coming down the line, uh, that it is uh, heredity. You should have uh, proper genealogy and so forth. That's, that's how you would determine who the ruler should be. And uh, others were saying it's really uh, scholarship should, that should determine who the ruler should be. The people who understand the values of Chinese society the best, they should be the rulers. And others were saying it's really heaven. Heaven. It's, a, it's divine right to rule. It's heaven that will determine. So you had this enormous debate going on. Mo Tzu, one of the Chinese philosophers, and Confucius were um, very strongly opposed to each other in regards to this matter. For Mo Tzu would say, it's really heaven. It's divine authority that should determine who the ruler should, who the ruler should be. And, um, and Confucius is insisting it should be the scholars. In the long run, it was Confucius that's, that won the debate. And uh, so those uh, political systems that were impressed by Confucius began to move in that direction. So now, if it is to be um, the righteous man uh, who rules, uh, who, 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 who gives leadership to the country, then how do you select who this righteous man will be? And that's the job of the scholars. They are the ones who understand the ins and outs of political leadership, according to Confucius. So Confucius was radically determined to sever political systems either from the authority of the gods, he didn't believe in them, or from heaven. Uh, he was a truly secularist man, we would say. Um, so it is, it is the righteousness of the man that determines whether he may rule or not, and it's the scholars that will determine whether he is a righteous man qualified to rule or not. But if it's the scholars, then you need scholars, don't you? And so Confucius was very committed to developing a system of education where people would have, where China broadly across the country would have good schools, people could enter first grade, they could study and study Confucian values. And then, as I said earlier, as they would come up through the educational system, eventually, and this was Confucius's dream, uh, of the very best students would be examined and when the Forbidden City was finally built, uh, they were examined in that Forbidden City to determine who the best, wisest scholars were to advise the government in the directions in which it should go. That was the Confucian debate. <clears throat> there are a number of, uh, of writings, philosophical writings, political writings, which are very important for Confucianism. 
One is the Analex. <clears throat> The Analex, uh, which um, uh, is a very significant uh, system of writings on political philosophy. The Book of Mencius. These are significant writings by Confucian scholars, which all students in, uh, in China would study so they could understand these values. Now, what are the core concepts? When you're looking for a scholar, looking for scholars who understand Confucianism and who will lead the country wisely, what are the core concepts that they look for that are important to become a wise and helpful leader? The one concept is Li. Li. Li is the way of the ancestors. And so within Confucian philosophy, the work of the scholars is primarily to study the way the ancestors did things. That's the first job of the scholars, because the perception was that the ancient ancestors did it right. So if we want to govern the society right, we must study the way of the ancestors. So the whole Confucian system has a fixation on the ancestors. Now try to imagine how that works in a modern world with so much change taking place and te technological revolutions and so forth. When you have a philosophy, a political philosophy that says you must focus on how the ancestors did it. Not just last year, not just the last generation, but back thousands of years, we need to be in touch with how they did it and attempt to bring all the society into harmony with the ancestors. Confucius had a fixation on that. Every aspect of life, even how you would come to the emperor to speak to the emperor, you must come uh, bowing slightly. It's described in the Analects. Come bowing slightly as you come to the emperor. And after you've had your audience with the emperor, you never turn your back on the emperor and walk out. You back up, you back up, you back up. You back up. That's how you meet the emperor, how you meet someone who's superior to you. And you don't back up with big steps. You back up with little steps. And in fact, when you come in to see him, you, bow, you walk with little steps. Not big steps, you see. Showing deference, respect, and so forth. Many, many such descriptions of the values and so forth which the ancestors held dear, which modern people should hold dear as well, according to the Confucian ethic. So Li, Li was one value that was very, very important. Also very important was Shu. Shu. Shu is fellow feeling. Do you remember within Buddhism, when the monk got sick, Buddha said, go care for him, but don't become entangled thereby. Confucianism says, no, become entangled thereby. <laughs> No, really, get into the other guy's shoes. Feel how he feels about the situation. Be empathetic, be sympathetic, fellow feeling. Join with the poor in understanding what it's like to be poor, you know. Do unto others as, uh, don't do to others what you wouldn't want someone to do to you. Get to feel how the fellow feels about how you're treating him and correct your ways if you're treating him in a way which is unkind and that you would not want to be treated that way, you see. So this Shu, this fellow feeling, is a very foundational principle within Confucianism. And very related to that is Jen. Jen, another very key value. Uh, Jen means compassion. To um, Give generously, to, uh, to serve generously, to give of yourself compassionately for the needs of other people. It's very similar to Shu, but Jen is actually putting wheels on it now to act in ways which uh, are um, uh, altruistic, uh, kindly, disposed, and so forth. 
This was a critical characteristic that all scholars were to carry forward with, the, the value of gen. Closely related to that is filial piety. which means honoring your parents and your family. Be very committed to your family system, to your parents, to your grandparents, to your great-grandparents. Be family-oriented, filial piety. When Grace and I, my wife and I, visited uh, this forbidden city, why, uh, we met with um, a, 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 high, a university student who took us to the city and explained it to us. Very, very good afternoon we had with him. And I was saying to him, I would suppose that, uh, tell, tell us about your family. Well, he said, my grandparents live here in Beijing. I, my parents live outside of the city, but my grandparents live here in the city. Well, I said, how wonderful that is that you can visit them from time to time. Oh, no, he said, I never visit my grandparents. I never visit them. I said, why not? I don't need them. Well, I said, uh, uh, you know, for me, if, if, to be a grandparent, father and have, have my grandchildren ever visit me, well, I would feel terrible about that. He said, what does it matter to me? I don't need them. And I thought, my, my, what a tremendous calamity this is in a society where filial piety has been so important down through the generations. For a couple thousand years, this has been a governing value within Chinese society. And here this young university student has nothing to do with his grandparents because uh, their ways of life and thinking and so forth are so different than his that he just gives him no attention at all. I felt that conversation unlocked from me a door into some of the tragedy of modern society uh, that, that it brings into these kinds of relationships within the family. Confucianism would cry out, oh, no, 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 as a grandson, you must minister to the needs of your grandparents and show piety and respect towards them. That would be the voice of Confucianism. And back in the days when they had these examinations, it was those kinds of values that they would look at very energetically as the young men and young women took these examinations. So filial piety is another very, very strong value. And then is Chun Tzu. Chun Tzu. Chun Tzu is the higher type of man, or manhood at its best. The whole idea is that the Confucian political system will function in a way that enables the person to become truly excellent. That's the purpose of the political system, to equip the person to become truly excellent, the higher type of man. Within communism, you might recall, they talked about the communist man, who was considered to be the ideal man. And the communist political philosophy and practice was supposed to create ideal people, the communist man, a good man. Within Confucianism, also, it was the political system that was to function in a way that enabled the person to become truly a higher type of man. Uh, and the Confucian scholars, whether they believe that heaven should choose the emperor or whether they believe that the scholars should choose the emperor, in the midst of all of that debate, all of them were united in their conviction that a good political system creates good people. That's the purpose of it all, the higher type of man. It was uh, uh, this uh, Motsu who said he can say for certain that if you had a truly good emperor, manhood at its best would come forth all across China within a generation. If we could just get a good emperor, then people all across China would become truly good. They would become the higher type of man. That was the goal of all of this. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com.